The title of my presentation is Nicholas Rorick and Continuation of a Great Russian Legacy. The great Russian artist and thinker, Nicholas Rorick, continued a tradition that began many centuries ago in Russia, a reverence and fascination for India. The renowned Russian Indologist G. N. Bombard Levy states that India has fascinated Russians from several millennia and that there are many references to Indian traditions, customs, and belief in ancient Russian literature and folklore. India was envisaged as a land of wisdom, wealth, and place of wonders. Spanning Ashtrakhan, Bukhara, Kabul, and Delhi, the Silk Road also played a determinant role in the exchange of ideas, skills, and products. Knowledge of India was transmitted through Alexandrian Greek texts to Byzantine scholars and then to Bulgarians, who in turn passed them on to Russia. Indian fables from the Panchatantra reached Russia through a Georgian scholar, Dadi Begashvili. There was brisk trade between India and the Transcaucasia. In medieval times, merchants and craftsmen from India came and settled in Ashokan and the Volga region bringing with them skills in weaving and manufacture of pottery and precious stones. A Hindu temple was built in Baku, Azerbaijan. The devout Christian Tsar Alexander III visited this site and became interested in Vedic rituals. The Golubinaya Kniga, or dark book with its cosmogenic theme, is supposed to be re reminiscent of the Purusha Shukta of the Vedas. India is mentioned in old Slavonic texts, the visit of Zosima to the Rahmans, which means the Brahmins, the narrative of the Rahmans and their amazing life. Even after Christianity came to India in the 11th century, Hindu rites and beliefs continued to interest Russian people. India is mentioned in ancient Slavonic ballads, such as the Bilina of Volk Vyacheslavich and the tale of Sadko of Novgorod type of Novgorod. Tatar Mongol rule brought Russian, Southern Russia, Central Asia, and India closer to caravan journeys and trade connections. Indians and the Sanskrit language are mentioned in the Laurentian Chronicle of 1377. One of the most fascinating Russian travelogues on India, Beyond Seven Seas, was written by Afnasi Nikitin, a merchant from the city of Tever, who has left behind a vivid description of India in the 15th century. When religious bigotry prevailed in Europe, this intrepid traveler displayed no religious intolerance in his observations. The eclectic Nikitin adopted the customs of his hosts, such as fasting on sacred days. Describing Hindu rituals, he said, they pray like Russians and bow in the monkish fashion. In his description of the wealth of India, there is no hint of future political or commercial adventures. Nikitin's literary work was incorporated in the Sufiskaya Chronicle. Though Peter the Great was a votary of Western science and technology, he had a Janus-like vision towards the Orient and India in particular. He realized that Russia would benefit from knowledge of Asian civilizations on her frontiers, especially India. He directed all available documents on India to be collected and annotated. It was the first time that a European government took such a serious interest in Indian civilization. In 1728, Tsar Peter established the Asiatic Museum to house Indian manuscripts and brought by scholars and travelers from India. This was the genesis of a systematic study of India. Zarina Catherine the Great continued the tradition and commissioned translations of fables from the Panchatantra and Hitopadesa, which were published in the Russian language in 1762. As William Jones was the founder of Indology in Western Europe, Indology became a serious study in Russia with Gerasim Lebedev, who was born in 1749. 
The Russian scholar was imbued with a passion to see India. He came to Calcutta in 1791. He earned his living by teaching Western music and by giving musical recitals at the New Theatre and at the homes of the rich. Levadiev was inspired to study Sanskrit, Bengali, and Hindi. He cultivated the acquaintance of Sanskrit pundits and scholars and friendship with Bengali intellectuals. Indeed, Gerasim Levadiev became a prominent member of Calcutta's cultural life. He is remembered, like William Jones, for the translation of Kalidas and for learning the wisdom of the Vedas. Levadiev writes in the late, late 18th century that India has much to be admired, such as high standards of morality, a vibrant culture, a well-ordered social life, and great respect given to learning. Russians came to know of Kalidasa's epic poem Shakuntala through their poet Nikolai Karamzin, who was living in Europe in 1790 when George Foster's translation of the great poetic drama appeared. Karamzin wrote the German Shakuntala in the Mos Moskovsky Journal and gave excerpts of Foster's translation. Karamzin declared that Kalidasa was as great, if not greater, than the Greek poet Homer. Years later, Shakuntala was produced at the Moscow Playhouse. The literary and intellectual treasure of Asia was now open to the Russian people. Great Russian writers like Alexander Pushkin expressed his ecstatic raptures over the splendor of the East. He knew about the epic Ramayana when his beloved Maria chose to accompany her husband into exile. Pushkin called Maria the daughter of the Ganges, likening her to Sita who chose exile with her husband. The foundations were thus laid for further development of Indian studies in both the Tsarist and Soviet era. The Orient was no stranger to Russia. Her vast Asian territories in the eras of the Tsars and the Commissars prompted her to widen her knowledge and understanding of Asian people. We see the Janus-like influence not only in literature and philosophy, but also in the works of great Russian composers who brought echoes of the Orient in their musical compositions. Enthused by the efflorescence of Oriental and Indological studies, the Russian government established the Institute of Oriental Studies in Moscow in 1818 and the Institute of Oriental Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg in 1823. Classical Sanskrit was made a compulsory subject in the faculties of history, philology, and Slavonic studies in many Russian universities. The research and writings of a galaxy of brilliant Russian Indologists in the 18th and 19th centuries made Indian civilization known to the Russian people and established foundations for future cultural dialogues. Long before Soviet ideology supported liberation of subjugated peoples, Russian journalists in the 18th and 19th century described the appalling features of British rule in India. Ian Radishtev wrote a severe indictment of British rule in India. He lamented, in quote, the fate of the heirs of a great civilization in the hands of cruel colonizers. The Slavophil philosophers advocated stronger ties with India rather than with the West. Russian Indologists approach their study and research without preconceived notions or agendas. As a result of the work of Russian Indologists, ordinary Russians acquired more knowledge about India than their European counterparts. Another Russian painter, Vasily Vershchagin, was drawn to the Orient. Apart from painting scenes in territories within the Russian Empire, he traveled to India with his wife and left behind exquisite paintings of Indian cities and edifices such as Raj Rajput palaces, temples, lakes, and mountains, and of course, the Taj Mahal. In India, he's remembered for the graphic 
and somber painting depicting the execution of Indian rebels during the Indian Mutiny of 1857. <coughs> the, illust the illustrated travelogue of Prince Sergei Saltikov indicate the deep interest of Russians in India, untainted by any political agendas. The world-renowned Lev Tolstoy was a student of Oriental Studies at the Kazan University, where he read Buddhist and Hindu philosophy in the Vedas, the Upanishads, and writings of Vivekananda. In 1909, Tolstoy told an editor of a prominent Russian publishing house that Vivekananda was the most eminent of modern Indian thinkers and should be published in Russia. Leo Tolstoy had an intuitive understanding and empathy for the Indian people. After hearing of the Indian uprising of 1857, he, along with other leading Russian intellectuals and journals, condemned the cold-blooded brutality of the British Raj in India. <clears throat> Leo Tolstoy corresponded with Indians who were chafing under British rule. He gave them advice, encouraged them to resist British rule by total civil disobedience. Do not serve their government. Do not attend their courts. Do not serve in their army or police. And do not pay their taxes, he advised. Encourage them by declaring Rebels cannot be enslaved. The role played by the Count Leo Tolstoy in inspiring Mahatma Gandhi in peaceful resistance to violence is well known. Rabindranath Tagore was inspired by Count Tolstoy's teachings and called him the teacher of humanity. A brilliant cluster of Russian scholars made major contributions to progress of Indology the Vedas, Upanishads, Buddhist texts, works of Sanskrit and other Indian language literature were read, analyzed, and interpreted. No account of Indo-Russian friendship can be complete without narrating Rabindranath Tagore's famous Letters from Russia, or Dashya Chiti, as it is in, written in Bengali, which is now considered an important historical document. He was the first of foreigners, first eminent foreigners, invited by the Soviet government to see the new socio-economic experiment. Prophetic at times, wistful at others, the greatest poet of India has left an unforgettable poetic travelogue. One cannot par paraphrase the grandeur of his works in Bengali or capture his rapture on seeing the transformation, transformation of the Russian people. And can, I can quote only a few lines. The transformation of the workers and peasants, as if by magic, is like a story from the Arabian Nights. The immense effort by, made by the Russians for the welfare of the ordinary people cannot be imagined by Indians who have lived under British rule. Until seeing conditions in Russia, I did not believe it is possible to have such progress in just a decade. They are trying to obliterate the injustices of a millennium in a decade. They have accepted suffering and sacrificed their lives for a new society. They are tightening their belts and striving to build a new order. But they have to do this swiftly because they have many adversaries. The immense effort made by the Russians for the welfare of ordinary people cannot be imagined. The great poet's vision extended into the future. He asked Russians to fortify themselves. And 10 years later, in June 1941, Nazi Germany attacked Russia. Both Rabindranath Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi mourned for Russia that day. Continuing this long tradition, a remarkable Russian artist and his family became a bridge between India and Russia long before India became an independent nation. His understanding and reverence for Indian traditions, culture, and philosophy is truly remarkable. From early years, Nikolai Revorich became deeply interested in and studied Oriental philosophy and art. 
he and his wife Elena had a variegated life both before and after the Bolshevik Revolution. They left Europe, they left Russia and moved to Europe. In 1923, the family arrived in Bombay on a cultural and spiritual journey. They met Indian scientists, scholars, and artists. Then they planned a journey to Ch Chinese Turkestan, the Altai region, Mongolia, and Tibet, where they wanted to study Tibetan Buddhism, the languages, customs, and culture of the people. In 1928, the family selected their new, new home on the foothills of the Himalayas in the Kulu Valley, where they established the Uruswati Himalayan Research Institute, which was organized to study the results of their expedition and those expeditions that were yet to come. The Institute's activities included botanical and ethnological and linguistic studies and the exploration of archaeological sites. Nicholas Rorick believed that the physical remains of a civilization was as, was as important as its intellectual and artistic traditions. He was deeply concerned about the preservation of ancient monuments and sites which are not yet under the care of the Archaeological Survey of India, which already had some 5,000 monument sites under its, lyrics, under its jurisdiction, including famous World Heritage Monuments. The two sons of Nikolai Rorik, Yuri and Svetoslav, were initiated into these studies. Nikolai Rorik wrote about his first Central Asian expedition in his book, The Heart of Asia, where he describes the rugged grandeur of the Himalayan landscape. Far from being daunted by this formidable terrain, the cosmopolitan Russian artist found a universal message in the Himalayas. Hindu religion considers the massive snow-covered Himalayan ranges as the abode of Lord Shiva, who combines in himself the forces of creation, preservation, and destruction. Nikolai Rorik appears to have been inspired by these ideas. It is the Himalayas which gave him both creative energy, creative energy and spiritual strength. Both Hinduism and Buddhism attracted him. He was fascinated by Hindu and Buddhist legends and myths. Madame Rorik was drawn to the concept of Shakti, the energy that is said to emanate from the divine woman. She interpreted her husband's vision, cosmos affirms the greatness of woman's creative principle. Woman is the personification of nature, and it is nature that teaches man, and not vice versa. Therefore, may all women realize the grandeur of their origin, and may they strive for knowledge. Images of the goddesses Parvati and Lakshmi inspired the Rorics and led them to paint their likeness. Nicholas Rorik also had deep reverence for the Himalayas, whose beauty and grandeur he captured in hundreds of paintings. His spirituality, however, did not contradict his concern for the physical and tangible cultural heritage of mankind. He, he emphasized the imperative to pres preserve monuments that were testimonies and achievements of various civilizations, as well as the ideas and thoughts that led to their creation. In pursuing this vision, Rorik was able to get support for preserving physical heritage through his famous Rorik Pact. Nikolai Rorik occupies a unique position as an artist and intellectual. Many other travelers who visited India and who have captured the sites of this vast and variegated land, from the lush tropical verdure of the south and east to the arid provinces where medieval citizens, medieval citizen, citadels speak of past battles and glories and the paradise on earth of Kashmir. Foreign uh, artists were lured to India from early medieval times. When the first Europeans arrived in India, they were fascinated and intrigued by Indian scenery and wanted to paint the new subjects. They had encounters with Indians to record and understand India. Iranians who came to India during the Mughal rule were known as Mughal artists. They were court painters 
were depicted the opulence and elegance of the imperial or princely courts. They came in the wake of traders and alien armies. In the political and economic battles for supremacy, the British East India Company prevailed over others. Between 1770 and 1835, about 30 British portrait painters trained in oil painting and 28 miniaturists came in search of commissions to India. Among the earliest European artists who visited India were James Forbes, William Hodges, Tilly Kettle, Johann Zoffany, William, and Thomas Daniels. <clears throat> From the early 19th century, these itinerant, itinerant artist travelers toured India working for local patrons, making paintings and prints of monuments, landscape, and portraits. But as Edward Munch stated, nature is not only all that is visible to the eye, it also includes the inner pictures of the soul. Nikolai Rorik achieved this. His paintings transcended from depicting the physical beauty of the land, the mountains and the people, to the inner spirit of the people and the country. His Himalayan paintings reflect the soul's yearning to delve into and understand the enigmas of existence. He had so identified himself with India and its people, who are not his own, but who he became one of them. When Nicholas Rorick's mortal form was cremated and his ashes were scattered on the snowy ranges, one feels that Lord Shiva stood on the highest snow-clad Himalayan peak to welcome the soul of this Russian son who had paid homage to his great abode. Svetoslav Rorik continued the legacy left by his father. He was the second son of Nikolai Rorik. After studying in USA, he came to India and followed in his father's footsteps and delved deep into the art and philosophy of India. He, having inherited the gift of painting from his father, Svetoslav painted Himalayan landscapes, portraits of hill folk, and village people. He also point, painted portraits of his parents, Jawaharlal Nehru Indira Gandhi, and that of his wife, Devi Karani, whom he married in 1945. Svetoslav Rorik headed the Department of Folk Art and Farmers College at the Institute of Rostov. While he was in charge of the work of the Natural de Department, he, res he did research in the field of natural sciences which deepened his belief in the sanctity of nature. As the friendship of Russia and India evolved from the 1950s, the Russian emigre and naturalized Indian Rory, with his Bengali wife from the Tibor family, became unofficial ambassadors in both lands. When I served as Joint Secretary in the Department of Education and Culture of Karnataka State, I had the privilege of meeting the celebrated couple Dr. Rorik was concerned about the future of the very valuable paintings of his father. He wanted them to be declared as national treasure of India, which would, which would prevent their dispersion, unlawful sale, and even smuggling. Soon after, in 1979, the Archaeological Survey of India placed the works of Nikolai Rorik under the category of national treasure. He was accorded the same honor as given to revered and well-loved Indian artists such as Rabindranath Tagore, Abhinandranath Tagore, Nandalal Bose, and Jamini Rao. Through the efforts of both Indian and state governments and cultural organizations, and the efforts of Svetoslav Rorik, paintings of his father are found in collections of major museums, art institutes, art galleries, and cultural institutes in the country. <clears throat> The creations of Nicholas Rorik are regarded as joint Russian-Indian cultural heritage, which sprang spontaneously from Nicholas Rorik's mystical bonds with India. My civil servant husband, who was interested in art history, and I spent several wonderful Sunday afternoons in the Rorik home on Edwards Road in Bangalore, just a few kilometers away from our own home. Dr. Rorik took us on a guided tour of his studio where we saw the famous paintings of the family. 
We discussed numerous subjects, politics, art, literature, and even astronomy. On one occasion, we met the then young diplomat Alexander Kadekin, who became in time a surrogate son to this celebrated couple. As with all great artists and writers, they live on, leaping over the barricades of time and space to their creations to become a heritage of mankind. This was certainly true of Nikolai Rolik.